Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just for a change, I'm going to tell you about some ceramics. Um, <laughs> but these ones are not medieval. Now, can I take you back to a time before sugar was a common part of our daily diet? Um, that's one of my burials that I'm currently doing up at White Fries in Perth. That's another story. Um, probably 14th century. The most striking thing about the burials is how fantastic your teeth are. No sugar in the diet. Now, that begins to change around about the middle of the 18th century when suddenly you get these sugar houses springing up all over Britain and in Scotland, especially on the west coast. Um, by the way, I recommend that resource to you. That's a fantastic website um, about the sugar industry and tells you an awful lot about the sugar houses and the whole process of how this works. In the 18th century, Greenock was known as Sugaropolis, the centre um, of sugar refining um, in Scotland. All the red dots on that map, which is from Brian Moore's website, are sugar houses. There's loads of them. Um, big buildings, big chimneys. Um, and very recently, the surviving sugar sheds um, were on the point of being flattened and removed completely from the scene. And when everybody started to say, let's keep these, let's turn them into houses. These were a major part of our history um, in this town. And as far as I know, that's been successful. Um, so these have been converted. Now, if we dive down into the actual way this works, um, the molasses um, are brought to the sugar house, um, probably from the Caribbean, uh, where the sugar cane plantations are. Then, the sugar loaves are made by using these two elements of ceramic. You have the cones at the top, and you have the distilling jars at the bottom. The molasses are poured into the cone, the syrup drips down into the jar. Once all the syrup has dripped through, you are left with the loaf in the cone, which you then tap out onto the table. Now, can I point out something to you here? 1700, already 10,000 tonnes of sugar has been consumed. 167 years later, 625,000 tonnes. Sugar becomes a, a really major part um, of our diet, um, which of course it is today. Um, what would we do about it? Now, to put this into focus, um, this really came about um, through some excavations that Sulat were doing in Dundee um, on the site of the new leisure centre, um, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. Um, at the same time, um, a colleague of mine, George Haggerty, was looking um, at ceramics associated with sugar refining from a site in Glasgow. Um, this is the site of, of the sugar works um, at um, Alston Street in, in Gallagate. Um, that's where that big red dot is there. Um, part of the building is still standing um, in, in the early 19th century. Um, also next door to that, there was the site of the pottery. Um, so we felt there was a very strong chance that pottery was probably making the jars and the cones. Um, these are the sort of samples um, that have been found in those excavations by Fiona Baker, um, who had done the archaeology. Now, coincidentally, at that time, Tanya Casimiro, who was a Portuguese archaeologist, was over in Scotland to look at possible Portuguese ceramics, uh, Mayakas, um, with a John Hurst travel grant. George and I were beginning to work on the pottery um, from the Gallagate, 
from Dundee and from a site in Edinburgh that I'll tell you about at the moment. And Tanya happened to see this stuff lying on the table and said, that's all Portuguese. And I said, well, on what basis are you saying that? I said, well, it has these very distinctive big white inclusions in the claim. That's very distinctive for Portuguese sugar refining material. So we thought, okay, um, that's something that's going to be worth checking. Um, and I'll show you how we did that uh, in a minute. The other site that we brought into the picture was the sugar house um, in the Cannon Gate in Edinburgh. Um, it's just across, or just down the road from the Scottish Parliament, in fact. Um, this site was being dug by Headland Archaeology. Um, I'm going to rather give away Sugar House Close. Um, again, parts of these very distinctive um, vessels. These um, are almost certainly the bottoms of the cones. Um, this is the bit that would have fitted into the top of the jar, so the syrup drops down um, through these holes. Now, older archaeology excavations in advance of the new leisure pool here, East Whale Lane in Dundee. Um, when the excavations started, um, they knew already that they were dealing with reclaimed land, so they thought they were probably going to be dealing with new, uh, with old um, harbour frontages, different phases of that. Um, they asked me to look at the pottery for them. Um, and Ray Cashart, who was supervising the site, said, we've got this really unusual big group of red wares, um, which I think are from either drainage or tiles. He said, but they've got this rather odd white surface on them. So, I had a look at this material, um, and I remembered um, through the wonders of CPD, I had been on English Heritage ceramic training course several years ago, which included um, <coughs> fragments of sugar refining vessels, which had this white surface on them. This is from a process called claying. When the sugar loaf is in the cone, the sugar, when, once all the syrup has dripped through, the, the sugar loaf is brown. That was not very popular for sale, so they used to pour white clay over <laughs> the brown sugar loaf, so that when you take it out, it looks white, and everybody likes white, so they all want to buy it. That claying process leaves this distinctive uh, element on the inside of the ceramic. So I said to Ray, that's not drain, that's sugar refining equipment. Interestingly enough, that's the site of the leisure centre there. The big red dot is the Dundee Sugar House, which is there from 1760s. The first manager of the Dundee Sugar House is one William Weidemann, a German, whose granddaughter was the mother of Robert Browning, the poet. Now, what's rather curious about this is sugar refining in Scotland was very much a West Coast based industry, but there are certainly sugar houses in Aberdeen, um, there's, there's probably several more. Um, this enterprise in Dundee was an experiment because they were still receiving all of their materials from Glasgow. All the molasses were coming from Glasgow to Dundee to the sugar house. Presumably they were using the Fourth and Clyde Canal, shipping stuff across that way and then back up round the coast. Um, but I have to say, it does seem a rather curious thing to do. Um, David Perry's paper in the journal is, does a lot of fantastic work on the documentary background to this sugar house, and, and it's fascinating. Um, you wouldn't believe that from this quote um, from a 19th century antiquarian, um, who, as you can say, says, what company is engaged in the sugar house, but of its importance to the community, no particular account has been obtained. Obviously, it didn't mean very much. Um, the sugar house um, stays there um, until 
the early 19th century when I guess they decided that the experiment hadn't worked um, and they went back to the union. <coughs> so there is no longer sugar heads um, in Dundee. Now, we have Tanya Casimiro saying all of your sugar refining material that I can see from these three Scottish sites is Portuguese. We think, okay, um, how can we see if that's right? We decided to use um, this wonderful new technique of chemical sourcing, um, which has made an enormous difference um, to our studies of ceramic in Scotland. Um, Historic Scotland funded um, this major project um, of trying to chemically source Scottish medieval redwares from across the country. Um, we included samples um, from right the way around the east coast, some areas from the west, and a big focus in the Fourth Valley. The best thing about this technique is that you can compare like with like. Yeah. Tanya sent across some Portuguese samples that we sampled, we chemically sourced at the same time as our Scottish material. So we have some Portuguese signals to compare our Scottish examples against. Now, first of all, on here, we have the results of the three Scottish sites. That's Glasgow, G, Edinburgh, and Dundee. Now, you can see that we are starting to get some <coughs> groupings of signals, but interestingly enough, at least one of them includes samples from all three of those sites. Um, although up here, the Dundee samples and the Glasgow samples are separating out. So we can see that there were differences already in the Scottish material. When you then throw the Portuguese samples into the mix, um, we have samples from Aveiro, Lagos, and Lisbon. The Aveiro samples down here, Lagos down here, some of the Lisbon samples are very close uh, to samples from Glasgow and Edinburgh. The Dundee material doesn't seem to match with any of those three Portuguese sites. That's an important point to make to you. That's only three Portuguese sites. There are an awful lot more. Um, when you put everything into the mix, um, we end up with our three separate groupings and Dr. Richard Jones at Glasgow University, who did all the analysis, said to myself and George, okay, some of the Edinburgh stuff looks like it could be Portuguese, but all the Dundee stuff, he said, I think that's a local redware. Um, George and I have never ever seen any redware like that from Dundee. We don't think it's local. Um, what we need to do um, is an obvious thing. We need to get some more Portuguese samples um, and put them into the mix and, and see if that clarifies the issue. A bigger problem is that our analysis of the Dundee Redwares was done right at the beginning of the pilot study um, of our Redware chemical sourcing. And in those days, we were getting a lot fewer elements we would like to reanalyze those because now we're getting a much bigger suite of elements. But I thought, look at this, these are sections um, of the different redwares. And what is distinctive are these white inclusions um, in the fabrics. No Scottish redwares have white inclusions like that in them at all, as to God. Um, there is no way that those Dundee sugar refining redwares can be local. Now, rather intriguingly, um, I said to you, sugar refining in Scotland kicks off in the 18th century. Why then, when I wrote up the pottery from Dorian Hunter's excavations at Stenhouse Newer, which took place in the 1950s, why do I have syrup jars from a kiln site which I think dates to the 15th or 16th century. The answer to that is very simple. Some of the pottery from Stanhouse has Maltese crosses on it. I think 
the potters at Stanhouse are making pottery for the Knights of St. John at Tall Thicken. Sugar loaves are something that I could see being on the table um, of the Knights Hospitalers in Tall Thicken. Um, that's something that needs a lot more work, but I think there is an argument here that there is sugar refining taking place in Scotland an awful lot earlier than you might think, although it's only very localised. Um, beyond that, we still occasionally get ceramic coming up where we have absolutely no idea what it is. I mean, look at these things. These are enormous jars about that height off the floor. Um, these are not local. Um, these must be imported, but I have absolutely no idea what they're being used for. I mean, it could be in the sugar industry, um, but again, that vessel doesn't really seem to work. Um, certainly not as a cone, um, and not really as a syrup jar either. Um, so, lots of things um, that we still need to sort out. Um, now, Interestingly enough, one of the major players in the Scottish sugar refining industry was Abram Lyle, as in Tate and Lyle. Um, and Tate and Lyle were refining sugar in, in Greenock um, in 1997. Up until then, they were still there, but now it's gone. There's all, the, all those buildings have been turned into housing. Um, what I think that does. Archaeology is wonderful because you can begin to get a handle on things um, which are unexpected um, and for which there's not really much in the way of surviving evidence. That work at the leisure centre, um, that, that was very lucky. I mean, the only reason I thought those were sugar refining vessels is because I've seen material like that from somewhere else. It's also a missing part um, of Dundee's industrial heritage. Um, and really just goes to prove um, that there's an awful lot more that we can find out, uh, just as long as we're looking in the right places. Thank you very much.